This is Epicenter, episode 369 with guest Sandeep Nailwall. Hi, I'm Sebastian Cochiro, and you're listening to Epicenter, the podcast where we interview crypto founders, builders, and thought leaders. On this show, we dive deep to learn how things work at a technical level, and we fly high to understand visionary concepts and long-term trends. If you like Epicenter, the best way to support us is to leave a review on Apple Podcasts. And if you're on a Mac or iOS device, the easiest way to do that is to go to epicenter.rocks slash Apple. And if you're new to the show, be sure to subscribe on iTunes, SoundCloud, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. Today, our guest is Sandeep Nailwall. He's the CEO of Matic. His company has recently launched the Matic Network, which is a scalable DApp platform built as a layer two on Ethereum. Matic is one of the many Ethereum scaling solutions we've explored on this show. If you're looking for more content on scaling, you can check out some of the recent episodes we did on this topic. There's episode 352 with Jack O'Halloran of Scale Labs, episode 336 with Jin Lang Wang and Carl Flourish of Optimism, and uh, episode 340 with Daniel Wang of Loopring. Matic provides secure and instant transactions using a sidechain based on an adapted implementation of Plasma and decentralized proof-of-stake network based on Tendermint. So like many of the scaling approaches I mentioned earlier, Matic tackles a specific use case. In this case, it's allowing developers to deploy decentralized apps on a sidechain. And since it's using Plasma, users can come in and out of Ethereum as they please since the tokens that exist on Matic are interoperable with the main chain. One of the things that the Matic team takes very seriously is user and developer experience. On the user side, their goal is to allow for the types of experiences people are used to with Web2, but leveraging blockchains. And on the developer side, this means offering a really high quality developer experience and making it super easy and accessible for anyone to build a dApp on their platform. So Mayor and I did this interview together and in true Mayor fashion, he'd offered some new inspiring analogies for how we should think about the growing ecosystem of layer one and layer two systems. I won't say any more here. I'll just let you listen to the interview and appreciate this insight for yourself. I'm not much of a dApp developer myself, but I've built a lot of websites using WordPress. And one of the things that's been immensely frustrating has always been DevOps, like deployment, maintenance, backups, and database management. Well, the folks at cPanel have built the WordPress toolkit for cPanel, and it makes it very easy for you to manage your WordPress infrastructure. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later on, but if you want to learn more now, you can go to epicenter.rocks slash cPanel. And our friends over at Algorand are hosting After Hours series where blockchain developers can meet their team and members of the community for informal conversations about Algorand. I'll also tell you a little bit more about that later on, but if you'd like to learn more, you can go to algorand.com slash epicenter. We're here with Sandeep Nailwal. He is the COO and co-founder of Matic. Uh, Matic is a company that has been in the Ethereum space for some time and is building scaling solutions for Ethereum. Of course, uh, we've talked about scaling on this show uh, at, at nauseum, it seems, of course. like We've had several uh, scaling projects on the show that all have different approaches and Matic has a very unique approach uh, within you know this broader kind of scaling solution ecosystem. And so we're very pleased to have him on with us today to talk about Matic and scaling for Ethereum. Thanks for joining us, Andy. Thanks for having me here, man. Thank you so much. And uh, been hearing about Epicenter for long as it's it's finally very nice to be here. Well, we're, we're really glad to have you. I mean, We've we've met before at, at DapCon, and I know that like back then, like I, I was really interested in Matic and what the kind of unique scaling solution that you were working on. It seemed a little bit early, I think, to have you on then. But now that the network is live and there's some traction on the platform, there's no better time to talk about Matic on the show. So, tell us a little bit about your background and how you became involved in crypto. Yeah, so basically, I got to know about Bitcoin like. Early on, like I think in 2013, even uh, like I discussed with my uh, like friend that, you know, we should think of mining Bitcoin or whatever. Uh, but, you know, at that point in time, I think it, it had already surpassed the point where you could actually mine, you know, Bitcoin on your laptop. So, you know, we kind of ditched the plan, but I never really got into the technology at that point in time. 
2015 is the time where I, you know, started uh, my my startup in the e-commerce space. It was more of a like services, e-commerce services startup, like for white collar services, B two B services basically. And uh, I was trying to build something like, uh, you know, a lot of you know non Indian companies actually go to India to hire talent and you know kind of uh, hire the vendors and all that. And there's a lot of like different different kind of vendors out there and uh, you know at times you don't know like which vendor is is the right vendor for you and all that so i kind of like thought that there is a like big gap in the market to get the right like high quality vendors uh, you know b2b vendors not like freelancers but proper vendors so i kind of you know started scope weaver uh, which was my previous like you know one of my previous startups so uh, there we kind of did well for some time like one one and a half years but it was not scaling that much like that that you know for which i came into the uh, you know overall entrepreneurial space and then that was a time when i realized that you know why i i like kind of did an internal analysis and realized that you know because of a lot of like people dependencies into it it would be very hard to even if i am able to break into the next level it will be very like it will be always a very slow grind towards the larger scale like like a billion dollar scale or whatever so then i started you know then i then i realized that you know the next thing i want to do like i don't want to continue on this next thing i want to do is on the in the high tech space so maybe artificial intelligence was really hot at that time so i started studying a bit about it and all that and then uh, you know from there i kind of like there was too much mathematics involved into it and i was like not like getting the 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 you know very 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 interested into it like you know that much interested so that you know i love it and kind of spend my life doing it then you know like because i was in the expert expertise space i you know bitcoin was just getting that kind of hype from the market so at that point in time i thought that yeah i mean this is this cool like let let me study about bitcoin and blockchains and all that and i started with the mastering bitcoin from andreas and knopless you know and then you know like fourth or fifth chapter into the into the book i was i like i had that aha moment like you know with which you fall into this into this rabbit hole and uh, <laughs> you know that was the time like when i said that this is big and i want to do something in this so initially i because i was like uh, uh, you know i am a blockchain programmer itself so i uh, you know got into the blockchain programming at that point and you know kind of initially did some uh, you know kind of uh consulting assignments or development assignments for few you know clients and all that and then you know i became more and more active in the blockchain community in india bitcoin community in india initially that's where like me and my other co-founder jd met uh where we used to answer the technical queries in the group uh you know for this and we knew that we knew each other that you know we like out of those like a lot of people over there uh you know there were only few people which were technical enough and i was J- and jd were there so we you know kind of uh, had that kind of friendship going and all that and that uh, around like end of like 2017 jd had started you know exploring on uh, plasma and he you know became a part of the plasma research group where you know vitalik and karl and all these people were there and there you know he kind of conceptualized this idea that we want to have a plasma which actually supports a evm because you know right now on the like at that point in time plasma was only supposed to be a payment Uh, kind of layer to for payments and you know the he kind of conceptualized that you know if we have a evm on the on the plasma it can actually scale the smart contract transactions also and that's where the idea of matic uh, was born and he kind of you know, talked to me and, and and you know around that time only we were he was also developing some of the you know tools like dagger you were just mentioning like it was a simple ethereum tool for listening to the events so we we got into talking and all that and i realized that this is really begin this can actually and and that was the around that was the time where the crypto kitties moment had also you know hit so you know it was like we realized that this is like this is a big problem in the space and you know let's do something to solve this and yeah i mean then we joined our hands and slowly like initially it was not a token project but then we realized that you know for the security of the network it will be required then then you know we we like matic became what matic is today like early 2018 we kind of set up the company and everything so we'll talk about more about the about plasma and 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 all the technical aspects of the of matic uh, a little bit later on first i'd like to talk a little bit about about the crypto scene specifically in bangalore um so 
the the Matic office, uh, at least before COVID, was in, in Bangalore, and you know Bangalore is known, you know, worldwide, but also like in Southeast Asia for its for its, its startup ecosystem. How significant is the crypto scene within that kind of broader startup ecosystem that consists of you know like consumer startups and like a lot of just kind of general consumer companies? And you know, does most of the kind of crypto startup activity come from Bangalore, or are there other kind of centers in India where uh, you see activity? Yeah. So, uh, in terms of crypto, initially, like what boomed in India was the crypto trading side of things. So, initially, the epicenter, if you if you would like to call it, uh, like you know, it was Mumbai. You know, it started there, and then you know, of course, Delhi was also like big in the scene. Bangalore, of course, there would be like a lot of a lot of trading groups and all that, but it was not that big initially. But then you know, slowly. Uh, the developers, uh, you know, got excited into the space. So this, this I'm talking about like end of 2017, very few developers uh, from India were actually in the blockchain space. And, uh, uh, you know, like it was mostly around crypto and crypto trading kind of stuff. So Bangalore was not that big at that point in time. Mumbai would be like much bigger and then Mumbai and Delhi would be much bigger in that sense. And then, of course, like, uh, you know, once the, like, like not once, but, you know, it, it took a lot of time for Indian developers to wake up. And even now, I would not say the, even though Bangalore is, like, considered a Silicon Valley of India and it's, like, pretty big in the startup space, but the, like, kind of entrepreneurial elite of India is still not very much into uh, crypto space that much because of the, you know, of course, the regulatory kind of gray area or kind of uncertainty that is there and frankly most don't understand you know blockchain that, that well also like whoever are there they are like kind of still uh, you know on the surface so I'm when I'm saying you know entrepreneurial elite I'm talking about like some of these top you know like engineering colleges like IITs and you know IIMs and all that like they because they have a lot of like funding available in the traditional space also and you know what not so even now like 99.9 percent of those startups would be going into only few startups now have started see, seeing uh, have started coming out from these elite kind of colleges of india uh, but like most of the other entrepreneurs are like you know mostly from the fintech center a uh, fintech kind of space who you know kind of got to know about crypto and you know were already there in some form of tech and then, you know, they, you know, want to do something in this. And, and, you know, when we started at that point in time, there was almost like no protocol team at all in the, in the, in the space. So, you know, when we started in 2017, and uh, like we realized that this is a big problem, uh, even though there were a lot of freelancer developers from India, but there were no like people who were into the protocol. And that's why our offices were also in Mumbai. Once we kind of, you know, raise our funds and all that, then we realize that, you know, in order to hire the talent, we might have to, like, we, we even thought that we have to, we might have to hire from outside of India because there might not be, you know, much talent. But we were very luckily surprised when we started interviewing a lot of people that a lot of Indian developers, the good developers who got interested and, you know, who understand, they were working for, for like, as freelancers for a lot of, like, US and Germany and Europe-based countries. And, uh, you know, we were able to hire easily over there. So now I think it's a very vibrant space in terms of like you can find a decent number of protocol developers in India. And with us also, like we have been like relentlessly doing so many hackathons like last year. And this is a crazy number that you're going to do. Last year, we did like 80 hackathons all over India. Uh, and, you know, these are apart from the global hackathons that we do. And most of the Ethereum community doesn't even know about it, that, you know, what we are doing uh, for for like you know spread of ethereum in india this year we would be like all of these are virtual now uh this year we'd be you know crossing more than like 100 120 is the estimate right now uh, and these are apart from the global hackathons that we do with gitcoin eth online and all that and these hackathons happen in like all the tech technology schools of india so slowly now the developer community is waking up and that's what we've been trying to do like you know go to the grassroots level if on the uh, if in on the technology school level the developers are interfaced to blockchain that this is also a good career opportunity and all that so they you know will be more excited about it and now like yeah so i mean we we kind of keep getting a lot of interest from the developers who are like as like college students fourth year students whatever 
you know to us for the recruitments and all and yeah like black uh, you know this uh, uh, bangalore's blockchain scene is now slowly slowly spreading like especially the tech uh, blockchain space if if that was the uh, you know that was your question crypto space is yeah. all over like you know mumbai delhi everywhere yeah i've been building wordpress websites for over 10 years and the most frustrating thing has always been devops i'm talking about deployment maintenance backups and database management i've lost so many hours of sleep doing wordpress infrastructure management if you've been building websites for as long as i have you're definitely familiar with cpanel they've been providing web hosting management software for 25 years well they have a new product it's called the wordpress toolkit for cpanel and i've been given an opportunity to try it out it's really cool it makes managing your wordpress websites really easy you can manage multiple wordpress sites from one dashboard and you can manage users and databases too. And because all your websites are managed from a single interface, you'll be more efficient. This is really useful if you're running multiple environments like staging and production. The WordPress toolkit can also apply security settings and policies to all your sites at once so you can harden and protect your company's website. There's a free light version and a deluxe paid version that has added features like website cloning and smart updates. That's also great if you're running multiple environments Anyway, if you're doing anything with WordPress today, I would really encourage you to check this out because it'll make your life so much easier. To learn more about the WordPress toolkit for cPanel and be informed when it comes out, go to epicenter.rocks slash cPanel. That's C-P-A-N-E-L. We'd like to thank cPanel for their support of the podcast. It's interesting you talk about the engineering schools and the, the types of funding that Sort of like alumni would would receive when uh, upon you know leaving those engineering schools and starting their own, their own businesses, and I think like I think country uh, India is a country that has gone through such a huge demographic shift in the last like ten fifteen years, and in many ways is kind of now very rapidly catching up to Europe and and America in terms of you know very mature uh, infrastructure and sort of like online services that of course like an entrepreneur is going to go build you know the next delivery for india or is going to go build the next um you know the next consumer startup because there's such a huge market and where crypto is kind of this fringe thing and so i wonder also to what extent this this regulatory stance on crypto in india has affected your business i mean just as a as a bit of an anecdote here like we have and have had team members uh, in India, and at one point we paid them in crypto, and that became harder and harder because they, you know, they couldn't uh, they couldn't sell that crypto for fiat. So I wonder how that's affected your business, either directly or indirectly. Yeah, so we kind of like anticipated this, uh, you know, pretty 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 earlier because you know I'm like fairly active in the business space, and uh, you know, kind of had the you know information that this is going to come sooner or later. So, you know, we kind of like our Indian entity, which actually hosts our Indian employees is absolutely uh, immune from the crypto space at all. Like it does not get anything in crypto. So we have a, you know, you know, come kind of a company structure, uh, which has like, uh, like a token issuer company and, a, you know, kind of a Singaporean company and, you know, any funds that Indian, Indian firm actually acts as a vendor to the uh, to the to the firms which are serving the foundation and it only gets the money in the INR so for us it has not affected uh, us that much in that sense uh, but yeah like the larger like as I was telling you the biggest casualty is that when we are growing the ecosystem in India like still a lot of uh, the projects or the early kind of startup requests or the you know the the the, the, the kind of early stage startups that come to us they are still like not of that quality which makes me feel that like I'm not, I'm not saying all of them like you know there are there are like few select projects which have gone on to do really great uh, you know have gone to you know list on the exchanges have launched their DeFi tokens and things like that but I'm saying that still the percentage is low like percentages like would be hardly 10-20% would be like really cool projects so uh, and you know backed by teams whom you can really like you know take the bet on or like at least like fully mature team like there are some of the teams but they are very early stage and all that so uh, i think the regulatory uncertainty affects that part the most because you know due to that the 
like even like i i can give you a very small anecdote like when i was getting getting married like my i, I had a hard time explaining it to my in laws that what exactly i do right and they like the moment they realized that oh this is something related to cryptocurrency like you know immediately there was a doubt that you know is there something fishy here right so i had to kind of convince them and you know this is this this is that i am more focused on the technology not the cryptocurrency side of things and and all that so that's the extent uh, even even my mom like you know who doesn't understand this one like every time uh, you know few months she will come to me like if she sees something on the news she she will come to me and you know be like you know what you are doing is fine right <laughs> and like we've all yeah. had those conversations with her mothers <laughs> <laughs> yeah and and i might add also uh, i mean my not my indian in-laws but my my soon to be indian in-laws i've also had that conversation with <laughs> <laughs> so so that's the that's the story with entrepreneurs indian entrepreneurs and definitely when you have that kind of branding so the 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 elite who can easily get like you know who can easily conceptualize an idea and build something in the traditional space they would find it you know they they won't find anything exciting to you know come and why do do all of this if you can do like much better uh, into the uh, traditional space so that that's one casualty and the biggest casualty of that and indian government also i don't really blame them that way because you know the the kind of background like if you want to understand indian like current indian government is especially on the techno, you know economic reforms is is fairly progressive uh, and then you know they have been pushing for digitalization and digitization and what not and you know like the digital payments have exploded in india like i think we would be like maybe one of the biggest in in, in on the global scale scale on terms of the Uh, digital payments and all that but you know you have to understand the background that india is coming from that uh, you know in the past like 50 years even if like not even 50 years like if you go back 10 15 years uh, you know you would you would hear that whatever indian gdp right you know you see at least 50% or like 30 40% of that will be unaccounted for like the we call that black market like you know which was done in cash and all that and the current government and the government before that like for the last 10 15 years especially this government they have strived hard to you know bring the information technology and and all that stuff like gst and and you know all your filings to be online and things like that so they have been trying to push that and you know your social security number tied with your all that stuff so so that you cannot kind of evade the regulatory purview and the moment you bring like crypto into the fold like you know india is coming from that dark period of 50 years of a socialist kind of country to becoming a capitalist country now and then suddenly like like it's it's hardly been 10 years and we are still struggling to you know get to the optimum levels and suddenly you introduce crypto and boom everything goes out goes out of the window right like you know whatever you did whatever you built in terms of your regulate regulatory you know framework or bringing people to the in the frame of like legal stuff goes out of the window so definitely they are going to be scared and they will go very slow on this and what they have been doing is that is fairly smart so they are actually they didn't they never banned like bitcoin is not banned in india bitcoin like payment in cryptocurrency is banned that means you can't consider uh like i can't work and you know raise an invoice to you in bitcoin that you can't do but i can have bitcoin as a digital asset with me and they never banned it all they did was they played very smartly so they have a so our federal bank is actually affiliated like if, if you want to open a bank you have to get affiliated with the federal bank of india and uh, which is the rbi and rbi what they, what they said is that they issued a circular to all the Uh, banks affiliated to it techni- like which means 100% of the banks in india that you should not support cryptocurrency exchanges the moment you stopped supporting exchanges you know <laughs> the immediately you can't convert like you you basically stop the on ramp off ramp right and then you know the problems that you were just mentioning that you know your team was facing that's exactly the same problem that the on ramp off ramp is now no more available but still you could do otc you could do like peer to peer transactions and i think indian uh, like you know the exchanges although it took a lot of time and then government actually did that smartly they wanted to play that uh, have that one one and a half two years of period to understand more about it and then india being a you know democratic country and free country like people uh, you know kind of applied against that circular or you know kind of file litigation in the courts and courts kind of subverted the rule because you know the 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 banks could not 
logically justify that why they 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 banned the exchanges right and either they have to come and say that hey cryptocurrency blockchain everything is banned and it's illegal then you can't do it or they can't simply go and say that hey you know you should not deal into this because that's against the personal liberty of an individual so uh, that circular got quashed and now that's why you see the heightened uh, you know kind of activity because that circular is no longer applicable now and then now the banks and everybody else is supporting the cryptocurrency exchanges and all that and in all this while the indian exchanges like wazirx bit bns they kind of circumvented it by creating very smart peer to peer like because india has a digital system uh, of payments called upi universal payment interface something like that so they kind of came up with these peer to peer uh, you know transfers so instead of you depositing money into an exchange account right now that you would do with coinbase instead of that you deposit into some intermediary accounts which then exchange gets to know that okay you deposited they give you the credit and when you are exiting you also get the money from you know multiple accounts so somebody was telling me they kind of got out like 100000 rupees and they got the money from 30 different bank accounts right so how do you kind of now ban the exchange account so you know like different kind of innovations people try to do and you know did it very well i think in that last one and a half years yeah that's that's such a fascinating story you know like what's what's going on what's going on in india we want to matic like yeah in this indian ecosystem what is matic and what is the main problem you are looking to solve so uh, you know as i said that uh, you know we like we we got like uh, you know the the matic got born uh, when the crypto you know kitties movement hit the ethereum space right and that's when we 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 started working on the scalability on layer 2 and you know the idea is very simple that whatever like and and we are like big ethereum community members right so whatever you can do on ethereum it's like such a beautiful thing like you know you have you can have turing complete smart contracts where you can write complex financial business logic and you know the the code gets executed as per the you know the the coded you know rules of the smart contract and, and it's like such a great thing and then you know which can actually change the course of human kind like how we interact how our systems interact how our organizations interact uh, and how we organize with each other right as human beings so you know the idea was to give it a scale wherein you know more and more applications can be built on 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 such a platform and that was the core that is the core idea about matic and you know as i was like going into more into technical details what we do is that we support a evm on the layer 2 like you know ethereum virtual machine and you know where you can not only do your payments but you can do smart contracts and you know the technology that you use to you use to kind of do it on you know you can take the transactions on a off like matic is essentially an off chain like you know execution platform than ethereum right so you are instead of executing things instead of executing smart contracts on ethereum you are executing them on a you know side chain which is evm enabled and all that and the technology where you can have this like using which you can have this verifiability into ethereum like everything is you know is verifiable on ethereum is what you know is plasma so plasma is basically a framework where if you are doing the transactions on the side chain you can kind of verify that and you know do a lot of stuff and of course like plasma has its fallacies so you know right now like for example if you wanted to uh, do like simple use cases simple logics like you know payments and dex transfers and all that those would be fully plasma enabled on the on the side chain but if you uh, uh, but if you want to do some complex uh, you know custom logic then you have to write like custom predicates for it like predicates is nothing but a fraud proof like think of it as a fraud proof that you are doing something on the side chain and you should be able to verify it on the main chain so it's easy to do for simple transactions like payments and you know dexes and all that but if you are doing a complex writing as complex smart contract then you have to write the custom predicates like what let's say for example augur team is doing like recently they uh, you know announced in public that they are integrating and all that so like you have to write custom predicates but otherwise like how matic like is differentiated from others is that you know instead of offering a single operator plasma which kind of you know puts all the like you have to trust a single operator like plasma was designed to have to have like even a single operator is there but he can't really like mess around your with your funds you can withdraw them to ethereum and all that so instead of having a single operator plasma which had its fallacies 
we kind of you know built a multi operator plasma on top of a you know bft tendermint chain where like these hundreds of these uh, validators can run the plasma uh, you know uh, plasma machines like you know where they they can execute the logic and you know all of these validators like periodically do a consensus amongst them and they post a checkpoint to the ethereum so the what differentiates is is that this uh, you know multi operator plasma layer is backed by a pos layer right so if you don't want to use let's say you don't want to get com- you know into the complicated predicate writing and all that what you do is you simply you know because the pos system that we have built like with 100 plus validators and all that is fairly robust so most of the games and other kind of use cases nfts and all that they simply end up relying on the pos layer they don't you know have the like the full blown plasma functionality into it compare that to something like augur which will have a full blown plasma functionality so now like once i've explained it to summarize on the like what matic is it's a layer 2 basically layer 2 means like an off chain execution platform and on that execution platform we we offer a uh, you know multiple ways to you know kind of secure your stuff on ethereum so one way is you can choose plasma or you can choose pos and in future and what dif- what differentiates us is that in future we are going to offer more security scenarios on the matic network for you for for a developer to choose so if you are developing a game you don't need that much level of like ethereum level of security like or decent like like security guarantees i would say like you know you don't want like to have full blown ethereum withdrawability and all that although you all you know get a large part of it already because of that robust pos layer but even then then you can simply rely on pos security if you want absolute you know uh, withdrawability and everything on on ethereum you can use plasma or maybe the the future approaches like optimistic rollups zk rollups and things like that so think of matic when you think when you're thinking of matic like right now it has a hybrid pos or plasma layer but think of matic as like a you know multi layer to approach in a very vague sense aggregator also like right now it's it, it offers you a pos side chain or a plasma but in future it will offer you more and as a developer you choose uh, what what you need and that's what is currently contributing to the you know you were mentioning about the traction of the network how these like you know applications like poly market and these are like you know now choosing matic because it's first it's production ready highly scalable and then as a developer you get the freedom to choose the you know the kind of security level you wanted to choose for your application so that's that's really fascinating Our friends over at Algorand are starting an office hours series. So every week or two, Algorand will bring together their team, partners, and community together for a live discussion intended to provide you with all the answers and resources you need towards building useful, meaningful blockchain applications. By joining office hours, you'll learn how to get started with command line tools and use the SDK and REST APIs to help you build applications for use cases like crowdfunding, asset tokenization, supply chain management, and gaming applications. Each office hour will start with a theme, for example, smart contracts or writing contracts in Python, followed by an open Q&A and chat. So if you're building on a blockchain protocol that has unfeasibly high or unpredictable transaction fees and doesn't provide you the speed you need, or if you work at a large enterprise or financial institution and are interested in learning how to build applications that can integrate with your current technology stack, or whether you have no blockchain experience at all and are just looking to take the first step into learning something new, Algorand could be the right solution for you. To learn more, visit algorand.com/epicenter for developer resources and information about their next office hours. We'd like to thank Algorand for their support of the podcast. When you look at the ecosystem broadly, like the way I tend to think of it is Ethereum is this 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 city. There's like lots of activity in the city, but it's kind of expensive to deploy anything in the city just like it's probably expensive to have an apartment in manhattan and a lot of suburbs are being built to the city where the hope is some of the applications could then be on the suburbs instead and it will be cheaper to deploy and execute your application on the suburb and sort of matic is one of these matic is one of these suburbs and in general there have been two kinds of approaches one is something something for example what solana might be might be doing which is com- a completely independent blockchain having a bridge to ethereum so that people could come from 
Ethereum into Solana and partake in some application there. But the security of these two systems is independent of each other. So when you actually, as a use, Ethereum user, you take your asset to Solana, you are completely trusting the security model of Solana. And on the other side is the optimistic rollup and ZK rollup space where it's another suburb to Ethereum, but they're trying to give the guarantees to the user that when they move their assets from the city onto the suburb, in some senses, their assets are still being secured by Ethereum, the city. And they can always, if something goes wrong on in the in the rollup they can always come back to ethereum and sec- like and ethereum will secure their assets and ensure that they don't get cheated in the in the rollup they're still relying on the city police as opposed to the the solana suburb has its own private security <laughs> yeah exactly exactly so it's like you're building a suburb and then are you relying on the city police or are you building a police force of your own and so Solana is building a police force of its own, whereas the optimistic rollup and ZK rollup space is they are they're trying to build it in a way that they can rely on the police of the of the city. I mean, I, I think this is a very brilliant way of putting it. But even like, you know, going that way, like think of Ethereum as a country, like, you know, like let's go on a larger scale. Like think of Ethereum as a country, and then you know, it has a city center which is like, you know, a city center which can be, let's say, New York right which is the ethereum main chain and it it is like now many people don't realize that ethereum already has like 60 odd side chains like some built by some private parties some like you know like like us with matic some like consider these you know side chains or all of these as different different states okay so you know you have uh, you know the core city as uh, ethereum main chain uh, you know maybe washington dc is the ethereum main chain which kind of like, you know, is the center of the the universe for it. And then, uh, you know, from there you have these different, different states and, you know, some of them, uh, you know, can be more uh, like, you know, tied to the federal structure of, you know, Washington DC. Some of them might want to remain independent and all that. And they have their own like pros and cons, right? They're like the state level security and, you know, policing and all that can be like slightly different on that. While Solana would be, like a completely separate country, which now like, you know, all this bridge and all that, like if you see all of these like Solana, Near and all that, what they have realized over the past, like last two two years back, like people like EOS and all that, they used to call themselves as like Ethereum killers, right? Now they realize that, you know, <laughs> you can't kill Ethereum, right? It's, it's a phenomenon itself. And what they have started doing is that they realize that instead of bad mouthing Ethereum, like rather try to be and this is like more of a you know like their uh, you know strategy to kind of capture the adoption that you know try to be closer to the ethereum space because all the developer 99 percent of developers are in ethereum so what these guys like Sol- near and solana and all these guys are doing is create a bridge with the ethereum and say that hey you know you can you can have things here you can be on ethereum but then transfer it over to us so this is like a like Trojan horse strategy from uh, many of these different layer one, uh, you know, this thing. And this is fine. Like that's a business strategy from their side. And as Ethereum community, like it's very open, you know, you can do whatever you want to do. If you can have a different country, which you can build and, you know, like in this analogy, which, which would be good and, you know, would be good for the larger uh, good of the overall, like the planet. Why not? Right. So, so that's the, that's the difference. And what, but in the layer two, like in the Ethereum country itself also, like there are different, different kind of layer twos, like consider them as different, different states. And some of those states would be like more stronger, have stronger policing and, you know, kind of whatnot, like uh, various different kind of, uh, you know, benefits and versus some of the other states would be like, you know, maybe some laggards in some, some spaces, but at the end, they all are tied up to the Ethereum community. Like, yeah. So like just amplification of your analogy and yeah, it's, it's a brilliant strategy to explain to like, you know, non-technical people. Mayor told me about this analogy last week. And it, it, once again, it, it's, it's one of those things that Mayor comes up with that blows my mind. So I love that we were able to unpack it here on, on the podcast. And to some extent, it's like if you think of it in the country analogy, you know, you, you think of those countries you know, if you if you come back to kind of you know imperialistic times, right, where you have like a country that you know is producing some sort of resource for like the main empire, or or you could think of it also in terms of like having free trade agreements with other countries, right? Like there's all kinds of ways you can 
bring on to this analogy maybe maybe one curiosity i have is my impression is that you know as matic you want to have your own independent security your own pos layer but you also want to enable dapps to you know borrow security from ethereum and you've built you're building tool sets for both but my impression is that most of the dapps that are actually successful in matic are just using the native matic pos layer so it's the case that independent security is proving a better product than being able to borrow security from ethereum is that is that correct yeah so i i you know that's that's not really the 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 exact reason behind it the the reason is like first is that you know even if you even if you think about the individual security like first of all the matic's pos layer like proof of stake and all the staking and everything staking rewards and all that everything happens on ethereum only so all the validators of matic actually have to register on ethereum on a smart contract where they register and then once they are registered then only they become a part of this like the the side chain validator layer and if they are doing anything if let's say they are participating in the consensus and then let's say they submit a like we call it a checkpoint proof they submit it onto ethereum if the ethereum smart contract does not like recognize them it will reject that so all these validators the security of the network everything is on ethereum now on the plasma uh, like you know th- what you are saying is that most of the applications end up using pos the reason is that it's simpler it's easy to use because they don't have to get into because plasma like the bigger problem is plasma is the one week withdrawal times so if you are exiting something from ethereum to uh, matic uh, or like matic to ethereum like withdrawing back to you know ethereum you have to wait for 7 days and there are people are doing like building like exit Uh, like kind of what do you call like toll bridges basically you can think of like toll bridges so you can pay some money and then you can get a faster exit the toll guy will give you a faster exit and all that so once people build those like easier interfaces where you can exit within like you know you can pay a small fees and you can exit with instantly then a lot of these people will might start using plasma also but right now it's all about ease of use and the user experience and that's where like right now and this is going to be the same thing for all the like optimistic rollups and and you know what not like even with optimistic rollups uh where you you have fraud proofs you will have at least like 24 hours to 4 day period of withdrawal like you know challenges because at the end what you are doing is that you are have to you have to kind of uh you know when if somebody is trying to do a fraudulent withdrawal you should be able to challenge it but then there are uh, there is other category of you know layer one exits like for example zk rollups which use validity proofs so with validity proofs the the delay period is not that big like you know then it comes down to maybe 10 20 30 minutes so right now but the problem is that when you are building on something like this you know your building experience goes for a toss like you have to do a lot of complicated stuff so at the end of the day the idea the long term goal for everyone like everyone who is working on layer 2 like us or anybody else the long term goal is that at the end there should be more like the the city policing uh, or kind of the 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 policing of washington dc or the federal structure where ethereum is the kind of the federal uh, kind of capital that is the most uh, you know beneficial way of doing it or better way of doing it because then you can have high value you know activities happening in these other states because they know that at the end if something happens the federal you know fbi is going to protect us like oh, like let's get into deep into that analogy like you have federal agencies who can protect you that means you can withdraw it back to ethereum so the end goal for all the layer 2s is that only whoever calls them layer 2 right if somebody is calling them layer 2 but then at the end they have a completely separate security where their validation everything happens on the site you know their own this one they are simply calling a bridge Uh, a a layer two, which is which is not the not the right thing. Like for example, example of that would be, let's say that like uh, you know, but although Solana and Near are not branding it, but technically you know in some form they are trying to be that. Uh, sim- for example, X Dai, for example, like they have a they they have a bridge, but their you know all that validation everything happens on a side chain. So they are they are a separate chain with a bridge. they they are no different from like let's say something like solana or near or anything like that so but in our scenario like if like if you separate out ethereum the network does not exist so 
but then again that's that's not the ideal approach the ideal approach again would be like as we are researching on optimistic roll ups zk roll ups the r approach is more of an aggregator approach if you think like that way is while you know you can have you, you can choose your level of security that you know but at the end we believe that everything will tie down to ethereum because that's where the value exists and you know you would want to have like stronger bridges to that federal structure so yeah and then you can choose among the spectrum that how closely you want to be governed with the uh, you know uh, with the federal structure like you do you want to be i don't know the states in us which are more close to federal you know this one uh, but maybe it depends on politics like if you are a republican then uh, you know and the republican uh, con- is is there in the uh, parties in the office so then they become closer to federal structure i don't know but yeah i mean i've heard stories that some of the states want to you know maintain their sovereignty so we want what we want to do is that we want to give the people the choice that if you want to live in texas live in texas if you want to live in something like uh, you know more closely governed by federal structure you do it that should that should be your choice but the country is ethereum something like that yeah this this is so fascinating i, I love this uh, i love this conversation i'd like to maybe just get a sense of where you position Matic, you know, we talked about all these other, you know, layer two or, or bridge solutions like Solana, uh, optimistic rollups, you know, we mentioned POA network. Uh, wh- where do you position Matic in, in, within, you know, this space? And why would someone choose to build on Matic over another solution? Is there a use case that's particularly well suited for Matic? Like right now, the biggest kind of advantage, uh, the kind of adoption we are getting is from the uh, NFT and gaming side. The best thing is that because we support an EVM. So for any developer who is building, uh, you know, like like on Ethereum and they want to have like faster transactions and low cost, like, you know, gas fees, which technically everyone wants, but not the people like something like, for example, somebody who is doing a very large value transactions, like hundreds of thousand dollars, they might, they probably don't need Matic. Like, but then if you have a system where, like average transaction cost, like if you're buying NFTs, which is which runs into like single digit dollars also, those, uh, you know, use cases are the biggest ones. So gaming, NFT, uh, like, you know, some micro lending use cases, DeFi, some of them, those are like, you know, using Matic. The biggest benefit is, you know, it's a production ready solution. So uh, that, you know, you have a EVM, if you have, you're already building for Ethereum, you can very easily integrate uh, your same code base and everything on, uh, on on Matic and, you know, have those bridges uh, like, you know, which comes uh, built in into the, into the network, simply use uh, an SDK or whatever to build that. So the develop, the ease of development is the biggest thing. And we have worked like, you know, last one year very extensively on that. So ease of development makes it very easy for the, like for developers to adopt that. And yeah, I mean like gaming, NFT, you know, early DeFi use cases, a lot of like, you know, crowdfunded, crowdfunding, social network kind of use cases, all of these make, uh, you know, much more sense. The high value DeFi use cases, like, you know, borrowing, lending and all that, right? Like, you know, they they might be well suit, better suited on Ethereum itself. Uh, you know, as far as the gas fees, like the, the something like liquidity mining doesn't strike back again. And, you know, we start seeing $300 gas fees. As far as that, uh, that doesn't happen. Like I think the DeFi, uh, the larger kind of value use cases are better secured on Ethereum itself. So you mentioned early on that uh, you were doing a lot of these hackathons uh, across India. So I'm curious if that's your go-to market strategy, um, doing a lot of hackathons and spotting these teams that are building dApps and then getting them to be on the Matic network. Is that the centerpiece of your business development approach? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, that that's definitely a big part of the community building uh, where the developer, like, you know, generally in one hackathon, it's like, you know, you won't find the, like one guy, one developer, you know, in the one hackathon itself, you know, finding something big and all that and building a system, the business out of it. You know, it takes them multiple uh, hackathons and we have seen this like, you know, some person joining one particular hackathon and then he participating in the next three 
in some different colleges because you can apply for different colleges also and you know all the global hackathons we keep doing the stuff we keep doing with the uh, you know gitcoin and all that so they get get to know more and more they get more and more comfortable and then once they realize that this is much more scalable easier to build they start kind of using it for their actual product eventually so hackathons definitely one big strategy uh and and yeah i mean individual reach outs also like we try to be aware of the markets as much as possible how much like who all is building what and all that like so we have a very solid business development team you can call them or devrel you know is the better word like developer relations team so we keep which keeps on like you know having a keen eye uh, that you know which projects are building what kind of technology especially like you know like we have teams like you know one team focuses on nfts other team would focus on defi projects other team will focus on rent, like miscellaneous use cases and things like that and uh, yeah there we there they spot the good kind of developers and then we kind of help them initially like from our side like even if they are not building on matic we kind of keep helping them on various various fronts and eventually when they realize that okay this is like much better platform i still stay on ethereum like most of the developers want to stay with closer to the ethereum community and that's why it's very hard for it's going to be hard for any other kind of layer 1 to you know out compete ethereum because you know like it's kind of that that uh, network effect that ethereum has like all the developers want their applications on ethereum and also everyone who gets introduced into the blockchain space he like their first blockchain is always ethereum right so because it it's what is most easy to explore and experiment and it's what which has the maximum documentation and you know organic like developer queries like when you as a developer when you are developing something you simply query that okay this this error is coming and you will see somebody would have written something about it and that's something which is which is very organic you there is no shortcut to that and any other blockchain uh, you know kind of platforms who are trying to build a separate kind of completely separate structure it's very hard for them to kind of achieve those kind of network effects so again coming back to the the strategy yes like anybody who's building on ethereum we talk to those teams and you know try to tell them the benefits help them and eventually they see the value if they see value in that they you know come across so i i want to come back to uh, a little bit of the the technical aspects of matic and uh, so we we talked about the the proof of stake system that you built alongside plasma and uh, i was kind of surprised to to find out that uh, matic um, leverages tendermint consensus Can you talk about some of the technical choices that you made here why you chose to build on on Tendermint and how it interacts with the other components in Matic? Uh basically if you see the technical architecture of Matic there is a three layer approach like so first like the base layer is the Ethereum layer where the staking and all that happens and the checkpointing happens right then the second layer is basically this Tendermint layer mm-hmm. why we chose Tendermint because you know Uh, at at that point in time even now i think it's the best choice to build a like best best sdk to build a you know like a different like pos chain so and it's customizable and all that so we did some heavy customization into it and added like the third layer into it which is a evm <coughs> layer which is the geth or kind of the bore uh, like we call it the bore node it's actually a modified form of geth only so like in why get because you know for evm it's kind of the the best client that way so you know so so you can see already see that you know three layer approach you have ethereum then you have the tendermint layer and then on top of that you have a get node integrated into it so it, you know as a single validator so design choices if you ask me that why we chose to you know do this pos so a uh, layer over there is that because you know with plasma the biggest problem is the data availability issue like you know if you are running one single operator plasma and the de- operator simply runs away doesn't share the data then you can't even exit on the main chain so what we did is that we kind of you know solved we tried to solve the data you know availability problem by decentralizing it like now you have 10 different uh, people who are running the chain or like 100 different people running the chain it's hard for them to collude and you know kind of uh you know do this running away thing together right and then on top of it like you have the evm layer so what we needed to be able to do is if it's layer 2 and then it you know it still kind of produces blocks every 6 7 8 seconds 10 seconds uh then 
because you are building a separate POS layer that will be subject to its own scalability constraints, it doesn't make much, much more sense, right? So what we had to do is we had to separate in order to achieve high amount of scalability that we today have like 7200 TPS and you know, uh, like two second block times and all that. So how to do that is that we basically kind of separated the validation and the execution layer. So the second and third layer, if you imagine, second layer is purely a validation layer. If you see the blocks of the tendermint layer, it's only about the validation parts, like where these validators constantly kind of validate all the blocks that are being provided, you know, generated by the third layer. And then, you know, every 30 minutes, they kind of, uh, you know, have a consensus between them and then send it to the Ethereum. Now, coming to the third layer, if, if let's say we wanted, we had to kind of create a third layer and which only produces the blocks and all that, then it becomes like a deep pass mechanism, which has been highly, you know, kind of not appreciated, right? Like with EOS and all that. So we didn't want to do a deep pass system where few people or out of these hundred validators, few people only have the capability to produce the blocks. So what we did is that we had, we, and we, you know, one of our earlier goals, and I should have mentioned it like this one, like more earlier, that, you know, for the layer two, one of our main design goals is we want it to be decentralized and censorship resistant. So although the optimistic rollups and, you know, kind of the, you know, ZK rollups and all that are very good solutions, but then they are subject to, uh, you know, centralization and, and, you know, censorship attacks also, because, you know, there is, there are one or two operators which are running the chain. So that was also a design goal, but we still had to achieve the scalability. So what we did is that the third layer, which is the validation layer, which is, sub, you know, separated from the execution layer. What happens is that this chain randomly selects a kind of a committee, like all hundred people are validators as well as block producers. But then there is a random committee selection, which happens, let's say every six minutes where this committee gets selected. And those six people, like those seven, eight people are now responsible for producing blocks for next six minutes. Then next committee comes, then next committee comes and all, all of this also happens, uh, like takes into account the amount of stake they have, right? So the more stake you have, the more chances you have to be a part of the, like, you know, the person who is going to be, or the validator who, who is going to put the checkpoint onto Ethereum. And that's when you get your staking rewards. So no matter what you are doing on the, on the side chain, at the end, you have to submit the proof of everything on Ethereum. And then you get only, then only you get your, uh, you know, rewards. So basically the validation layer is only meant like the tendermint layer only is focused on doing the validations of all the blocks that are being produced. And then the like execution layer is a subcommittee. You can now think of it as a subcommittee, which gets created out of these validators and it randomly keeps on fluctuate, keeps on, you know, kind of randomly rotating these other validators and you know, nobody gets to know upfront that, you know, who is going to be the validator and uh, you know, in the next cycle, I mean, only the next few cycles you can understand, but not like on a larger scale, you can't run a censorship attack or something like that. So, so yeah, that was the reason to kind of separate the validator layer from the execution layer so that we can keep the system centralized, you know, fairly decentralized. But then even, even then, if you want to achieve the scalability, you can't have hundred validators and, you know, running the chain at two second, three second block times, right? So you, because the block propagation takes time. So what you do is that you select random committee every few, we call, call it spans and sprints, every few spin, uh, you know, span, you create a new committee, which kind of generates the blocks. Hope that makes sense. Like there's a lot of detail in that, but yeah, I hope it makes some sense. So just to recap, the, the validator set is validating the POS chain. And then there is a, a random subset of these validators that are executing the smart contract logic, right? Who are actually creating the blocks of the EVM chain. So there are two actually, types of blocks are being created. One is the EVM chain blocks, which is being created by the committee. And then you have this tendermint layer blocks, which is, which only has the data related to the validation of the latest blocks that were created. And every 30 minutes, they do a consensus amongst them, two by three consensus amongst them, create a checkpoint of all the transactions that have happened, like all the blocks that have been produced and put it on Ethereum. And then only they get staking rewards. So what are the security trade-offs of this approach? What, like what, what trust assumptions does one have to have in the system when operating in, in, this, in this configuration? Yeah, so the 
trust assumptions like if you are using pos then you are definitely trusting the the the, the pos layer if you are using pos only if you are using plasma then because of this like the the main thing is main assumption that you are you are you are taking here is that that because the the number of validators is like really high and uh, you know out of them randomly some of the validators are being selected and if you think of it now like those that committee that gets selected for a span or sprint whatever like every 6 minutes that committee is actually a committee of plasma operators right so they are running the 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 plasma kind of for that particular time they are the operators and they get keep getting shuffled right so the trust assumption is that you know these like having a large set of decentralized kind of operators you will have the data availability and as far as you have the data availability you will be able to if something goes wrong and if you are using plasma you will be able to exit it to ethereum that's the main thing and having that chain as more decentralized and you know tendermint consensus bft consensus and all that like that solves a lot of like you know liveliness and you know like that those kind of network uh, requirements so east 2 is on the way and the beacon chain is launching next week does east 2 change the development plans for matic in in any way and yeah how how does matic fit into the broader east 2 ecosystem as it as it develops yeah so uh, there are multiple uh, you know like multiple facets of this like first and the foremost facet is that you know the what is launching is more uh, is like the phase 0 of e2.0 and the real like time where you will be able to execute your transactions or run your smart contracts on a shard would be is, is like fairly away like you know 2 to 3 years minimum you know like where you will have a reusable chain like this is like the first phase of this the entire process right so it's fairly away and one has to see like you know ethereum uh, you must have seen that vitalik's like roll up centric or layer 2 centric ethereum roadmap also right so eth like you know you have to keep in mind that eth, eth ethereum is now a very decentralized community and you know there is no one roadmap for that like you know there is a layer 2 specific roadmap there is a uh you know eth 2.0 sharding a specific roadmap now even within that what i believe is like you know let's do simple calculations for example right now like you know ethereum 1 has let's say 13 transactions per second and you have like you're going to have 64 shards you know with eth 2.0 so and each shard will be like will closely resemble let's say eth eth 1.0 currently even if you have pos maybe the tps of these chains will go from let's say 13 to 15 tps to maybe let's say 30 tps whatever right and inter shard communication is even like further away like it's it may be like 5 years away i don't know so each chain is basically ethereum like for the next 3 3 4 years like if even if e 2.0 comes in it will be like a group of independent chains you know having the same like acting like bridge and if you think it that way it you know you will start seeing matic uh, you know architecture also similar like you know the one side chain that i i told you that the one part i missed that you know the validator layer separation of validator and execution layer actually enables you to have multiple execution layers so on the same you know validator layer we can have tens and tens of chains running on top of it and then it will start resembling more closer to it 2.0 kind of system where you have multiple shards multiple chains Uh, which are and and Ethereum one is kind of the beacon chain over there, right? So they are talking to Ethereum. So but yeah, coming back to the ETH two point zero architecture, so inter shard communication is going to be like even further away. So like three four years or whatever. So what's going to happen is that you have you'll have sixty four shards, and let's assume that even inter shard communication is also there in three years, and you can assume all of this TPS as one single DPS, and you know like smart contracts can interact with each other across different shards. let's assume all of that even then the 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 networks like full capacity would be 64 into let's say 20 30 transactions per second hardly like 2000 transactions per second and if you see it that way like a 64 times extension of ethereum 1.0 or even 100 times one uh, extension of ethereum 1.0 simply defi will be able to eat eat up all of that bandwidth like the right now the like the the demand and supply of this like you know is is like you have x amount of supply of the transactions per second let's think of it as a commodity 
the transactions per second or gas basically per block, let's say, and you already have 10x that demand, right? And, and that too is like unsustainable demand, speculative demand, because you know, you have $10, $20 transaction paying people because they are speculating. But if it goes to the wider, you know, public and you know, the, the real like uh, traditional public starts coming into it, you already are looking at like thousand folds demand than what it uh, like, you know, what, what is there currently, not even thousand, like even more than that. But I'm saying that even with ETH 2.0, the moment it comes in, the bandwidth will, will get consumed very fast. And then again, you will be in a situation that where do these like large transaction scenarios, like, you know, gaming and all that, uh, NFTs and, you know, again, a lot of like social networks, where do they go? Because only the E 2.0, the entire bandwidth can be very easily eaten up by DeFi. We are not even like at the starting of the DeFi, like the real big guns have not even traditional world have not even jumped into the field yet. So the, the, the long-term thesis for us is that layer two for any chain, like even if like you had a chain like Solana or whatever, like, you know, the, the chain was there and eventually they will also get exhausted. And the ideal way is to have like one settlement layer like Ethereum or Ethereum 2.0 and the business activity has like non-opinionated, you know, execution environment. So talking to a huge number of like, you know, people who, are, who want to build or are building applications on blockchains, you know, one thing is very clear that there is no one, one size fits all solution, right? So every, you know, every enterprise, every client, every business has their own needs, own requirements. So, you know, having thinking of a, this internet 3.0 or web 3.0 as one opinionated platform and, you know, everything running on that does not make sense. So that's why we, we strongly believe our thesis that, you know, there will be one settlement layer and then there will be one like, you know, layer two or kind of non-opinionated layer two kind of environment, which kind of connects back to this central settlement layer, which is Ethereum in our opinion. And, you know, the business activity can happen on layer two. So even when ETH 2.0 comes in, nothing changes on our side. Uh, what we are doing, we keep doing that, keep adding more and more layer two approaches and, you know, like which suit multiple different businesses. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think this the, the way to look at this as a, a multi-blockchain ecosystem is what makes the most sense to me. I mean, I've always been kind of confronted with this with this very idea that you know people people put out there that there's going to be one blockchain to rule them all. And sure, that might be appealing, but I mean, just look at the way software development has has evolved into this ecosystem of languages and and stacks, right? So not not just you know a single development language, but you know a, a series of tools that are combined together in a stack, and you know these these languages and technologies kind of like overlap between the stacks, etc. And so that you have you end up having these monoliths, and some are of course you know uh, much more present in, than than others. Like in web development, you might say that's Node, for example. But there's like there at, at some point in the past, you know PHP MySQL was the the predominant stack and in some circles it might have been like ASP you know the Microsoft approach and so I think that it makes total sense to assume that in in a future where uh, blockchain systems are uh, driving a lot of economic activity and you know beyond that uh, we have different stacks that serve you know specific uh, use cases and needs and perhaps even serve certain applications in in certain geographies etc. And that it will end up being a very diverse set of tools, and of course, lots, lots will probably disappear. Right, lots of the of the approaches that we're using today might not exist in ten years, but it'll be an ongoing uh, evolution of systems that uh, that make up the ecosystem. Absolutely, that makes sense. As we're ending, uh, arriving here to the uh, to the end of uh, of our conversation, uh, you you did mention Dagger a little bit, and we were talking about this before the show that. You know, Matic and the team have been contributing to you know, quite a few different tools in the ecosystem, and I was surprised to find out that Wallet Connect was one of them. Um, talk about this this philosophy or this this kind of strategy of also uh, building other tools than you know just the product you're, you're that you're working on. What is your contribution to say other uh, other tools in the ecosystem? So I, I mean, I think that the biggest in terms of the tooling uh, support, like. You know, back in the day, we used to like, uh, as I told you that, you know, we contributed to the same community with, with Dagger and we even 
like uh, like wallet connect so our team was actively involved in you know building the first ever like production ready version of uh, this one like you know jd himself was uh, like he himself relieved that part so you know in terms of like we also contribute to the like tendermint uh, you know like like we built something called side channels uh, in tendermint which we believe is the right approach for uh, you know inter like ibc also inter blockchain communication uh, protocol also so uh, like a lot of this stuff in terms of open source part but i think in the last like you know 6 to 8 months uh, you know we have been more on the you know kind of consuming end uh, you know where we are providing this production ready you know platform so we are getting a lot of like help from the open source community in terms of using let's say blocks blocks block scout which has been built by poa network for example using that as a block explorer and, and you know like we used geth uh, as the you know this one so like it's a, it's a combination of like the technology built from this one so but on the tooling side like the idea is to you know keep contributing to the to 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 all the tools that we are currently using so you know like as i told that tendermint consensus we contributed something and uh, now like our team is very actively you know actively researching into the zero knowledge side of things and we expect more kind of contribution from our teams team into the the roll up space also so yeah so overall this this the strategy is right now our focus is actually on the developer tooling side of things is to get or make everything that is available on ethereum uh, available on uh, matic also so you know the oracles like chainlink launch their mainnet on 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 matic like you know then all the uh, other like top oracle platforms are also lo- launching their uh, like you know teller network yesterday announced uh, similarly all the like the the bigger bigger name that you will hear in the oracle space they are launching similarly something like gnosis safe and all that so right now we are more on the receiving end in terms of having all the tooling that is available on ethereum uh, make it available on on matic uh, but once everything stabilizes then definitely like that contributing back to whatever feedback we keep getting from the users the contribution of that back into the ecosystem will will be like the way to go from there itself yeah what do you think is the solution here i see this as a pretty complex problem where you know if you want people to come to matic you need to also have the tooling you know you mentioned like gnosis safe or you know any other uh applications that people are used to using on ethereum main chain as the ecosystem grows and there are many you know c- cities right uh they they also need access to these kind of essential services it it seems difficult to scale where uh you know uh, you know come back to gnosis safe you know they have to deploy also on matic and also on like you know some other some other side chain or another blockchain what what's the solution here is interoperability the only are like mature interoperability tools the only way forward or are we going to be stuck you know having you know, multiple deployments of the same the same core technology on all these side chains yeah i mean i think that the biggest problem actually is not the deployment across the the things like you know the the problem bigger problem is that you know is is that there are not enough paying customers as yet like you know for example gnosis safe they would be very happy to deploy on multiple chains as far as like people were willing to pay for it right but right now they have to do this pro bono right similarly for infura they have to do all of this stuff like pro bono uh, to kind of fuel the early adoption but eventually i think that uh, you know if this when this when the system grows big enough then they will be like you know more and more paying customers for these uh, these guys and then you know scaling is not difficult right now problem is that for all this tooling you have to do it in public interest like as public good right free public goods right that's the challenge i don't think that uh, you know if there are enough paying customers like anybody minds uh, you know scaling their tooling to different ways like for example dagger if you see from our, if you ask from us like we have been like i think i think we spend like couple of 100 dollars every month to just keep the system because there are a lot of applications which are currently using dagger and we keep it up uh you know just for the sake of these these applications and but then you know nobody is paying us for that and uh, the moment we bring in a pay payment plan onto that and although that that's not our core this thing but even if we bring it that bring that people will start using some other free service 
right so like i think the 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 problem here is not the scaling of these tooling because that's easy you know that has been done in the web2 space very well is more of like uh, you know the business models that are available uh, you know or the users that are available paying users that are available or not so while going through the matic architecture one of the main main concerns i had was that the design choices that matic made make sense from a 2018 perspective i am somewhat curious and skeptical that they make sense from a 2020 perspective so here's here's what i i'll i'll qualify that statement more so when you look at like 2020 and 2021 for any like l2 and blockchain network ultimately like you need consensus you need like a way to like execute the smart contracts and of and and certain like very key, large key inventions are are coming along the way i i th- and i think like the two two biggest ones are you know avalanche consensus which is actually better than tendermint consensus on most dimensions so avalanche consensus is most faster it can support a lot more validators than tendermint consensus the second the second key shift i see coming in the ecosystem is in the evm you have like the single threaded execution so uh evm like every transaction comes it needs to be processed state needs to be updated then the next transaction process state updated etc whereas like solana execution is different in solana execution you can have 100 transactions come in and if they impact different parts of the state they can all be processed in parallel on a gpu so the main advantage solana execution smart contract execution creates is parallel proce- processing on a gpu which is why solana is able to be like 10 times maybe even like even in the future 100 times more scalable than any other smart contract system out there because they are able to exploit this parallelism of a gpu in the blockchain context so do you think this is a concern that like there are going to be better smart contract execution environments as well as consensus algorithms and the combination of these two things is going to and then you're going to compete on a business level with these platforms that have just these better inventions and you will be stuck with tendermint and evm and in the long run this will end up have being a suboptimal choice do you have a worry like that yeah so uh, i i'll answer them uh, you know one by one for example so so f- so for example this one like uh, the tendermint uh, and using let's say the evm like uh, system like one thing one important word i, I like you know keep i keep using is the production readiness of these things right so uh, you know that comes from the proven record of a particular technology so 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 for example tendermint they they might like tendermint might have ha- easily have like 100 plus chains built on top of it and you know it's it's fairly stable avalanche even though like they i think few one or two months back they have launched their mainnet that is also a restricted i don't think it's a full blown full functionality mainnet if we would if we would have waited for something like that you know we would we would again will become like those uh, ghost research paper projects which talk a lot of <laughs> you know you know that like you know talk a lot of futuristic things but they don't have anything you know running on in the production so that was the choice that we we kind of you know actively uh, have actively taken we want to have a production ready network where you can have next level of secu- uh, you know scalability on top of ethereum so if we are able to do like for, from 13 transactions per second we are able to do 7200 transactions per second that's already a fairly big uh, you know leap from there and to counter the like you know let's say the scalability requirement if let's say that requirement is not enough as i already told you that we separated the validation layer with the execution layer so we can actually add multiple such side chains into the into the system at a, at a much rapid rapid pace now so that is also one more uh, you know one one more important part over there that you know the like in terms of from our perspective we see this platform like this network Uh, like we do, we don't we don't expect this to go from today where like if you combine all the dapps in the ethereum ecosystem or the overall ecosystem you will hardly have 10000 dau like 10000 to 100000 dau 
if you include 100,000, if you include all the like token transfers, like these uh, like Bitcoin transfers and all that, like in the whole space, that's a very, very small DAU in that sense. I don't have an exact, you know, fact sheet on that, that, you know, somebody would have done the analysis, but roughly that's what people, you know, say. And if you come to dApps, it's, it's hardly, you know, hardly with all the dApps combined, 10,000 DAU, right? So, you know, right now we need to go from 10,000 to the next million or, you know, 10 million users. And I think with the current scalability choices available on top of Ethereum, you would be able to easily go to that level. Uh, with Solana, like, as you said that, you know, like there are multiple, like there is, it's, it's a very interesting concept that you can have multiple parallel, uh, you know, executions and all that. But then there are other, like people have shown concerns also uh, in terms of the centralization of such an system because of the state bloat, right? The, if the state becomes bloated too big, right? You know, like if you're doing 50,000 transactions per second, your state can be, can get bloated very, very fast. And then only a few people will be able to run it because, you know, if you want to run it fast, then you need to load the entire state onto the RAM, right? And then it's very hard to, you know, kind of have a 32 GB RAM or 50 GB RAM, whatever, like if, you, if your state starts growing too fast. So there are multiple concerns and, you know, why we took the design choices with, which we took is that, you know, first of all, they are proven. And plus we have a plan on our side, like, you know, we can add multiple side chains. Plus we are now working on different layer two approaches. So, you know, we have our backup plans that when, if let's say this chain starts getting, you know, bloated and we start seeing 32 trans, 3200 transactions per second, uh, you know, then we can easily create more chains. Secondly, in terms of scalability, like a lot of people would be talking about the scalability, but like Matic right now, like you combine all the layer ones, like near Solana, combine all of them, the like combined number of transactions that they have there on mainnet, we'll have 10 times that on our, you know, layer two platform on Ethereum. And I re recently tweeted about also that, you know, combined adoption of all these platforms, we have much bigger at a simple like Ethereum layer two project. We are, we have much adoption that much more adoption than that. So, uh, you know, like, and we see like 7,200 transactions per second is far, far away from here. Like even with this, all these huge number of applications, we hardly see like four, five, 10 transactions per second, because you know, the number of users is, is so, so less. And uh, so, I mean, we have a good path to go to reach to the current uh, and, you know, occupy the current level of scalability that is available. Plus we have the backup design choices that, you know, which it, it can take to, to the, to the next level. So, and yeah, like the provability, like, you know, provenness of the system is, is also very important because we want to have a production grade ready system, uh, you know, instead of more of an experimental system, which many of these systems, I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, these systems will not evolve. This can actually, they can be very sturdier system. And then that's why I told you that, you know, our approach is, we are not stuck on one particular approach that, okay, this is the approach. As I told you that we want to offer multiple layer two approaches, who knows? In, in one year from now, we'll be offering an avalanche consensus on top of Ethereum as layer two. Like nobody is stop, stopping us to do, uh, you know, from doing that. And very interesting part, but, you know, there are a lot of, you know, internal things that are going on. But maybe, you know, three months from now, you know, we can we can maybe revisit this particular thing, Meher. And you will see what I, I, was, I was referring to. So I hope that makes sense. Yeah, and it would, it would certainly be cool to see you know, different consensus mechanisms being supported on Matic. Before we wrap up here, where can people find you and how can people learn how to build scalable apps on Matic? Uh, so the best place to find us is on uh, Twitter and Telegram at the rate Matic Network uh, are our handles. And uh, my personal handle is my full name at the rate Sandeep Narwal. And I'm like, if you are developing anything uh, on in the blockchain space and you know you want to scale your applications you know do reach out to us we you know are very supportive for the good dapps we help them on multiple fronts like scalability you know go to market you know your we, we refer you you guys to you know investor investors and whatnot so you know kind of the entire end-to-end -end incubation we do and we have a very you know if if there are early stage developers we have a very interesting build and earn program on gitcoin where we kind of sort of give grants $50,000 worth of grant every month. And if you are building something, you can, you know, register your application there. And if the community votes for you, you get to, you know, get a, you know, good part of that grant and you can, you know, kind of bootstrap your application. Great. Sandeep, thanks for joining us today.
Yeah, thank you so much for having me here. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, the guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week. <laughs>